Hi everyone, it's Simon here from Be Sober and I'm delighted to be joined by Lisa and Alex from Sober Experiment. How are you guys today? Hi Simon, Hi, really Simon. good, thank you. Thanks so thank much you. for joining me. I've been watching what you guys have been doing on social media and I've been checking your website out and I'm so excited to hear more about Sober Experiment, learn more about your plans. But what I was keen to find out a bit more about was first of all, your stories, like how did you end up getting where you are now? Do you want to go first? Yeah, he's going to go first. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. So um, I'll, I'll share a bit about both of us just because it's a similar sort of background. So we both, uh, we met when uh, we were 11 and 12 years old um, through our parents. Um, my father and Lisa's stepfather were very good friends. My dad was a professional musician um, and they'd met through socialising through drinking and going out and um Lisa's stepdad was um, really into his music, so that's how they got friends. They were quite big drinkers. Um, our mums met through them, and then we were introduced. So that's the point at which I'll just move on to my own story. So I grew up, um, worked in pubs, um, went out into pubs all the time. Lisa's mum actually owned a pub that I worked there with Lisa. So we've actually worked together for years, but it's like the opposite now. Um and yeah, uh, lots of obviously life tragedies. Um, we've obviously grown up together through our teens, 20s, 30s. Um, we've lost a couple of friends through drinking. We've lost since then. My father died of cirrhosis and a heart attack. Um, Lisa's stepfather the same. Um, and yeah, it, it got to a point where, so if I fast forward, late 30s, um, Lisa can tell you her whys, but she'd stopped drinking. I felt that things were just going disastrous for me. Um, I was using drinking to cope. I was going out or at least drinking in the house every single weekend. There was never a weekend without. Friday through Sunday, I would either be drinking or hungover. And it got to the point where my hangovers were just so bad and so lingering and so debilitating and my relationship was suffering and my children were suffering because they weren't getting the best of me, that I just thought, you know what, I've absolutely had enough of this and something has to give. You know, yeah, you got to that bit where you at the stage, I, I think I, I totally relate to that, where you were kind of just sick and tired of being sick and tired. You just had enough yeah. of it. So, yeah. And it sounds like a lot of the sort of pub culture, that kind of conditioning over the years, because I read your story, which you kindly sent through, um, which, which is on my blog, and um, I kind of picked up on that. So, so you guys were drinking buddies as well, I guess, then, so you're, now you're sober buddies. You, we, we were top drinking buddies, or so we thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, we did. We used to ring each other quite a lot because we'd we'd obviously go out and drink together, but we'd we live like about forty minutes away from each yeah. other, so we'd go and do it separately. So we used to kind of like ring each other over the weekend, and it'd be like, oh my god, you're not believe you're not going to believe what I've done, <laughs> and then it'd be like, oh, don't worry about it. Everybody does that, so we'd kind of encourage each other a lot and kind of normalise our behaviour and what we were doing because. We were such good, well, we are such good friends, not yeah. we were. <laughs> I think it's so awesome that two good friends can become sober together. It's actually quite rare. I don't see that a lot. So it's a really awesome story. I love that. We're so lucky. I'm grateful, honestly, every single day that my best friend is sober. I couldn't even wish for anything more and I do know it is quite rare and we are really really mm. lucky aren't we I was just jealous and like she can't do anything without me joining in so as soon as Lisa <laughs> became a rebel I wanted a bit of rebellion as well and just went I'm doing this yeah. <laughs> to be fair she got me smoking and drinking when I was younger anyway <laughs> <laughs> and I don't do any of them things anymore <laughs> but the thing is I often I mean and as you probably do talk to people about the power of being accountable and having somebody who knows what you're doing who can keep an eye on you who, who you feel you know, responsible to so by that with that connection it's amazing you're never going to kind of let each other down well we can't now no can't, you can't yeah, it's the great day. But the thing the thing the other day because i mean i don't know I, i'll be dead honest and vulnerable i guess here now but so, you know everybody has those days where you just think oh my god what have i done like and then you start to doubt yourself and and certainly early on really early on you think you know can i do this you know oh maybe i wasn't that bad maybe i could just have one all those yeah, usual thoughts yeah. but now it is quite literally a case of well i can't do that i wouldn't do that because then where does it leave the other one yeah <laughs> exactly that 
And so I, I suppose the, the question everybody wants to hear is like, how, how did you quit? You know, what, what tools or tactics, you know, how did you make that decision? But what, what was the kind of key to unlocking the door to freedom? You go first with us. I think we've just been discussing this actually. And for me, it was hangovers, just like Alex getting just sick and tired of the same old thing every weekend. And anybody that asks me how I quit drinking, reading, yeah. I think it's so, so important. Quit lit books are were, were just hugely important to my success of stopping drinking. Facebook groups. I think that's really important, yeah. finding people that just get it, yeah. you know, because when I stopped early on, I was I was on my own with it, all my family drank, all my friends did, there was nobody else that kind of was, they were shocked really that I decided to stop drinking. I was bloody shocked. I know, <laughs> you know, she was shocked, my kids were shocked, so just nobody understood or, or got what I was talking about, so when I kind of... Um, my first book that I read was Catherine Gray's book, The Unexpected Joy of Being oh, Sober. Oh, yeah, I've got it down um, there somewhere. Yeah, right but right on my desk here, yeah. Yeah, um, and I just think to read that and think, oh, my God, somebody just gets it. And then I kind of realised that there's a full group of people out there on Facebook and Instagram that just get yeah. it, and it was really, really important to me that. We, we were actually talking before because... Um, and about this, and, and we, Lisa particularly has got quite a lot of guilt about this because people say, did you find it hard? And Lisa, she doesn't find it hard because the, of the mindset and the way that she's done it, and she's just really positive. So rather than, you know, oh, I can't drink again, I can't drink again, it, Lisa will actively say, you know, this is my choice, I choose not to drink, right. and I don't want to drink. It's, it's like, it's not a punishment, this. This is something I want for my life. And I'm having to talk to her quite a lot, really, about yeah. not feeling guilty for for feeling that because yes some people do find it difficult and a lot more challenging but she's really lucky that she doesn't and she's had a massive impact on my mindset so I don't actually find it hard either yeah that's awesome and mindset is the key the absolute key I, I posted a video on YouTube um, earlier this week and it said why we should think like a vegan and the point the point of it was but the people who are vegan are passionate about what they do. They've made the choice themselves. It's a lifestyle choice and they're positive about it. And if you know, if we, we think like vegans, we're not being deprived of something or having something taken away from us. It's a, a positive choice that we're making to be a better version of ourselves, and which it sounds like is what you guys have done. It is, and I don't think by being positive that necessarily means, you know, that every day you're up and you're like, everything's wonderful. I just think, for me, it's looking at the glass as half full all the not time. Alcohol, not of alcohol. No, no. no. <laughs> Definitely not. Yeah, like sometimes it can be hard to be positive. You know, you've got to, I have affirmations on my mirror when I get up. I read a lot of self-help books. It's something that I practice daily. I use meditation, things like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that helps. It helps me a lot. And we've both gone through really difficult times, actually. Probably harder times in the last 18 months between us. Um, well, sober, just dealing with things so we're not trying to say to anyone that it's an easy ride it's not it's not an easy ride but it is simple to do so you, if you can switch your mindset exactly. and say to yourself you know what this is what i want this is what i'm going to do then yeah you're going to have challenging days lisa was on the phone crying to me a couple of weeks ago i was on the phone crying to her a couple of weeks ago we you know but that's that's how it is well exactly and just quitting drinking doesn't mean that shit doesn't happen you know things still come yeah. up um, but i feel personally that and I'm, by the sounds of it you guys are absolutely the same I just feel so much more grounded mentally resilient tougher you know things that used to cause a meltdown don't cause a meltdown any longer so uh, and you're able to deal with things in just a much more kind of grown-up way I suppose rather than you know bursting into tears at the slightest thing but then things still come up that do cause that and it, it happens but you, I just you know I've had some challenges with my son around his gender and his sexuality that the old drink in me would have been a crap dad and I feel like I've actually been a, a good dad and you know I've put my arm around his shoulder I've gone on the journey with him and embraced it and enjoyed it whereas before I would have just reached for another bottle of Shiraz and, and, and not wanted to get involved. 
Yeah, so, so I think that's, that's right. such a lovely feeling as well, I think, when you can actually sit there and think, I've been a good parent. I've been a good parent today because it wasn't often that I would have said that when I was a drinker. I would have celebrated my maybe good parenting with a glass of wine yeah. or I'd have commiserated <laughs> with a couple of bottles. Yeah. So, yeah, I get that. Like, I'm ashamed to say that. I mean, I've got a three-year-old. I've got a 14, 12 and three. And even, well, he was two at the time. But I used to just rush through his story at night and get him in the bath quick, quick, quick. So I could go downstairs and enjoy my well-deserved glass of red, you know what I mean? Oh my god, that's exactly what I used to do. You know, it was when it was getting close to eight o'clock, I would be getting tetchy and think, you know, when are you gonna go to bed? When can I break that wine open? And then, you know, if he came back downstairs, I was kind of ashamed that I was sort of sat there drinking and you know, go go away, I want to carry on drinking, sort of thing. And yeah, you know, when time, yeah. And when you think of that, you know, you've given that drink kind of power and put it in front of the most important things in your life. Like, what? Why would we do that? But it's easy to say now. But you know, and this is why it's so important with programs like yours, where people can recognise actually, I'm putting this stuff in front of things that really matter to me. Why have I given it so much power in my life? Yeah, definitely. And, and it's I, awful. I mean. Yeah. It, when, once you get to a stage where, I mean, I, I still read, um, I, I read even now and I, I have always got a sober book on the go, I have always got a self-help book on the go and an audio, I literally just surround myself in that and I think once you've, once you've done that and you know the science behind it and you know other people's stories and you, you realise that actually, you know, there should be no such word as alcoholic, I don't think I was ever an alcoholic, I don't identify with that term, you know, alcohol's addictive there's a scale where you can start it and end it, but you're going to be somewhere on it. Yeah, exactly. It's funny you say that. So um, when I talked at This Naked Mind live in um, September in Denver, I talked about labels and I don't identify as an alcoholic. I don't like the term recovery. Sounds like I'm sick or injured or yeah, got an illness. Yeah. You know, and however, but I, I was the week before I was going to talk about it, I'd mentioned this thing about alcoholic and somebody in my group said to me, well, actually that term motivates me. I, I use that term and I do identify as it. And it was the first person who had ever said that to me. So I quickly changed my talk. So I kind of covered that piece, but I, I'm exactly the same. You know, I, ex-smokers don't get given labels why should people who drink be given labels um you know we can be who we want to be it's up to us I, I i'm simon and i don't drink simple as that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, that, and that's how it should be yeah we, we were talking um as well about what was we saying about alcohol before and the um how you identify with it I've forgotten. It's gone out of my head. I'll come back, <laughs> I'll to, come back to that <laughs> one the train of thought. that's not really me that <laughs> Yeah, I lost my train of thought. But yeah, it, it, it's about your own identity and identifying as yourself. I think I was going along the same lines as you. So I was basically just agreeing. So <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> just just nod politely. <laughs> that's cool. So um, obviously that's a bit about your story. And in terms of the biggest benefits you've seen, you know, people love to hear the, the glowing skin, the darkness under my eyes has gone, my hair hasn't grown back yet. But you know, what's happened? what have you guys noticed? <laughs> um you can go with this I you? think I was going to say the darkness but actually I'm really tired today so I have got bags under my eyes um, but no I think like you said skin hair patience I actually have a lot less anxiety when I used to drink I wouldn't even pick up my phone if I didn't know the number in the week and I found, found now that I am a lot less anxious a lot more confident I'm kind of sure about what I've said. You know, like before, I was always kind of apologising or I, I was just unsure, unsure, whereas now I've said something and I mean it. <laughs> and, yeah, I'm quite, it and I'm quite confident with that. Um, just time, just being more present. I've been out to dinner today with some friends I was telling Alex before and we sat and had a conversation and for the first time in about... 18 months actually I thought oh, I've just really listened I've really enjoyed that conversation so I just feel like I'm a better friend a better parent a better daughter just I just think it's amazing yeah and it, and it, <laughs> for me it's clarity as well you know like it's that um clarity of thought I just say clarity don't I when I forgot what I was saying before but yeah yeah it's clarity, of, clarity of thought you know like you sort of 
you're sure you're self-assured you don't have any self-doubt i think that's that's, that's it, it is. Yeah. yeah you know what you did last night you know what you're going to do tomorrow you know when you say something you mean it and, and nobody can kind of trick you into saying you did or said something else and i think i used to lack quite a lot of confidence because of that because people could say to me you did this last night and i'd be like oh did i so yeah it, to realize that actually nobody can do that to me again because i'm not doing it to myself that's quite good. And it's your choice. Yeah, you could drink whenever you want. You just don't want it. Yeah, <laughs> laughing as well. Can I add that? Yeah. Like, yeah. We proper laugh, don't we? All the like, time. Like belly, belly laughing. And, you know, when we did our first ever podcast and we spent a good 40 minutes laughing and we even sat there and I was like, I can't remember the last time I genuinely did that. I've gone like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> 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 like, I'm like, yeah, but it really laughing and feeling things, which isn't always a benefit, but mostly is. But yeah, is... I mean, Lisa was saying she doesn't get anxiety anymore. I'm the other way. I've actually realised what an anxious person I am. But I don't mind. I don't mind feeling it because, you know, I'm, I'm going through the good, I'm going through the bad. But, yeah, it's me, so great. But that see, that's really interesting. Well, there's a couple of things there that are really interesting. I mean... I can totally associate with the anxiety. I, mean, I actually can remember the day when it started to fade away and I started to smile and laugh again. And I'd been a miserable git for years. And you know, it was just holding me back. And I, suddenly like these dark clouds started fading away and I was just found myself smiling again and, and laughing and feeling like naturally happy, which was a very strange feeling after a, a long, long time. Um, so yeah, the, I mean, the anxiety thing comes up time and time and time time again and then also in terms of feeling a little bit more anxious that's the true version of you isn't it coming out yeah. and you can see that well that's who I really am and uh, you know and then that I mean the number of people who use alcohol to become an extrovert when actually they're an introvert and that's what they're comfortable with and that's who they really were yeah, and it, it's a it's amazing you discover the true version of you and sometimes you discover things you might not actually like or you might need to work on but you haven't got that false armor of alcohol around you so that's that's a it really interesting but i can definitely relate to the anxiety side of things big time and the, and the introvert thing when you said that i thought i was a, you know the life and soul of the party and i loved going out and i loved socializing and i don't i love staying in yeah <laughs> in fact, sometimes I don't even like talking to anybody yeah exactly <laughs> yeah and that's what I, I i think a lot of ex drinkers are the same they thought they were the life and soul of the party but in fact they'd rather stay at home with a good book under their blanket and, yeah. and a cup of tea and then you get the pity. This is what I was going to say. I remembered. Oh, <laughs> last. The, the people that go like this to you, oh, it's, like, they might not say it, but they certainly look at you that way. Like, oh, it's a shame you can't have a drink. <laughs> no, I can. I just choose not to. Yeah. It's that, it's that you know, where I was saying, but... <laughs> I mean, I, I, I often, when I coach people, I kind of always warn them to keep their guard up for the odd negative reaction. I mean, I, I was really vocal about it when I quit. I told everybody and I, I kind of wish I had a strategy, but um, I learned a few lessons. But and 99% of people were really supportive and nice, but there's one or two who clearly felt, well, I probably made them hold up a mirror to their own drinking or made them feel judged. And they kind of made a few nasty comments and called me boring and told me it wouldn't last one of them was posting pictures of all our drunk nights out on facebook for about three weeks afterwards but it just motivated me i don't know about you i'm exactly the same i am a rebel don't tell me i can't do anything yeah. because i'm gonna do it and i'm gonna do it really really well yeah. <laughs> and that sounded really obnoxious and i didn't mean it like that but I did find that completely motivated me. One of my first calls was to a friend and it was like, I'm stopping for 100 days. I'd kind of started it as an experiment. We both did, didn't we? Yeah. Which is kind of where the sober experiment came from. But yeah, one of my friends was like, there's no way you'll last that long. And I was like, will I not? I'll yeah, do yeah. it forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll see. That's, that's exactly how I felt. It was like a red rag to a ball. If I'm, yeah, you know, accountability was great, but that was better. So there are some, there are some positives to, I mean, not everybody takes it the same way, but I think it's great if you can take some energy from that and use it in a positive way. That's brilliant. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. So tell, tell me more about the sober experiment. Yeah. You know, what, 
what can people expect from it? Well, obviously, it's a 30-day program. I know that much. But how does it work? Motivational emails? Yeah, it, it kind of started. We Originally, we were just going to have like a, um, a Facebook group and we were going to get people to come in and do 30 days like we did and then see where it went from there. But it just evolved and actually... We've got the Facebook group so people can join and they don't have to be in there for 30 days. We've got people at all stages now and we're getting more and more members. Um, yeah, and then we've got our daily emails. So we have got a coaching program. We've made some videos. They're only very short, just less than five minutes each video um, and a journal that goes with it and with a workbook. Awesome. <laughs> and then um, yeah so so people can sign up to that and, and do a 30-day kind of experiment um that that's quite new and that but it's working for those we've had a, few, a fair bit of feedback now haven't we on that we have and um, the videos like alex said they're only really short but they're all about changing the mindset yeah, and yeah, kind of just getting people to think about their own drinking so it's not a case of stopping for 30 days and then let's all go to the pub at the end of that 30 days it's kind of just getting people to really really think about what why the what's and the yeah, why yeah, really. yeah and it's not preachy it's more about yeah getting them to consider so so that everything becomes a little bit more mindful really and then if they go back to drinking fine that's up to them but at least they'll have the facts and they're not just being blindsided yeah and they've made a conscious choice to yeah to um, where alcohol features in their lives yeah, and then our kind of biggest thing um, that we're doing is the workplace presentations. Yeah. Um, so it's the same kind of thing, but we do a presentation in the workplace, and then as a whole workforce, we ask them to sign up for the 30 days as part of that package. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and then obviously you get that big team ethos thing, but for the employer, huge benefits. I mean, they're – how many thousand? Eight, 89? 89,000. 89,000 people in the UK going to work hungover every single day. And it's costing billions. Oh, it's billions. Crazy. So, yeah. You know, if you look at just one person in 10 in a workforce on the minimum wage, if they didn't go into work ever hungover for a year, that employer would save nearly £7,000 just on that one. So it, it is, it's impacting productivity. But then the other thing we're looking at is the wellness side of it, the mental health, you know, the, lots of people using alcohol to self-medicate for mental health problems. Um, I think the last statistics say one in four in the UK are diagnosed every year with a mental health problem. And that, that's underestimated because of self-medication. Or the other way that we started to look at it is, well, maybe the drinking is what's leading to the mental health because we've already alluded to our um, to depression, to anxiety, yeah. and it's a fact that most suicides occur under the influence of alcohol, right. so you know, this is something people don't want to talk about. No, exactly, and from my perspective, being a guy in the sober world, yeah, there's very few men that speak out about that topic, mm -hmm. you know, either, you know, they're, either they're drinking, their mental health, or God forbid suicide, you know, it's like, I'm a bloke, I'm not going to talk about it, which is why I was quite passionate about actually trying to get out there and share my story. I mean, my Facebook group is 70, 70 something percent theme, you know, ladies and, and yeah. 30, 20, about 28 percent guys, you know, and, and it's the same in most of the groups I work in, but there are more and more guys talking about this stuff. So going into workplaces, it kind of, you know, you're taking it to them rather than waiting for them to, to come to you as well, the guys and girls, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. And we kind of just want to share the raise awareness. You know, there is people that are really struggling and they don't say so. You know, they might be going home every night, drinking wine or a few beers. It's completely, you know, impacting the work, the social, everything. And they're too ashamed to say so because there's such a stigma around alcoholics and having a problem with alcohol. And I think we kind of want to help yeah remove that you know what it's okay to have a problem with alcohol it's addictive yeah exactly and, ch and the, the whole thinking around it needs to be changed from you know you're, you're not an alcoholic you're now should be passionately sober and excited about joining yeah, this like awesome that. club but, so i love that <laughs> <laughs> that's two phrases i've coined this week the other one was liquid vegan so that which is <laughs> from oh, I'm, I'm actually a vegan as well so oh I'm there sorry. you go well you are a liquid vegan then <laughs> yeah, try cooking for us. Yeah, oh god, yeah. Tonight it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so if if I'm someone who's looking to change my relationship with alcohol, I sign up to the program. I'm going to get daily videos, 
daily emails do you do any uh, sort of more is there obviously there's interaction with the group do you go live in the group or can they reach out to a coach yeah both i mean we do we drop in live to the group we're not not as often as we'd like to do yet but that's just because we've been getting things going but yeah every fortnight we drop into the group and just even if we don't drop in we will write in and say does anybody want us to go live and if somebody right. says yeah i'd love you to we'll go in um so yeah we do that through zoom or through a live um and yeah we've we've take we've started up a coaching side to this as well brilliant um brilliant. which is one-to-one -one coaching and all of that information's on our website Awesome, and I'll put a link with the video when I share it as well, so anyone who's interested in checking out more can do exactly that. But it looks like an awesome program. Do you, do you have people from around the world, or is it mainly for the UK? It's it, we've got a lot from everywhere. Yeah, haven't we? with the, there's a lot from all around the world, which we're really excited about. Canada, USA, um, Australia, yeah. and then we've got a couple of people from the Netherlands as well. Um, yeah, there just there seems to be pockets of people, but yeah, yeah that, that's our main, and then obviously the UK. That's awesome. I, I, it sounds brilliant. I hope it keeps on growing. I mean, I've shared you know shared the group a few times in um, in my be sober group, and you know anyone watching this video obviously is welcome to come and check it out as well. And I suppose the the last thing we should cover is some tips for Christmas parties sober. What would you uh, <laughs> recommend for that one? I've been sharing uh, a bit in my group this oh, week. Oh, I've got one. Go um, on. <laughs> So, take your own drink just in case. Maybe keep a bottle in the car of a non-alcoholic beer. Um, and or... you can take your car. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. Because I went to a bit of a birthday do the other day. I rang up first just to check that they had non-alcoholic drinks idea. or preparation. Yeah. That's a good idea, yeah. Um, rang up first and it was like, yeah, we've got some non-alcoholic beers. We can do your mocktails. And I got there and they didn't have any. Oh, and I was really, really sad about yeah, that. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, take a bottle in your car just in case. Yeah. And, and I think as well, it's all about planning when you're doing any sort of event, whether it be going out with friends or going to a party. It's about planning what you're going to say when people ask you, are you having one or why are you not having one? It's having that line ready and knowing it. But do do the work before you go. And I think you say this in your book as well, Simon, if you if you visualise yourself in that place and actually yeah. walk yourself through it, what you're going to wear, what you're going to say, what you're going to order at the bar and just have that mental vision of it you will do it that way. The worst thing you can do is to turn up somewhere and be caught off guard because that's when things can go wrong. Yeah, exactly. That little bit of preparation beforehand is a great idea. And um, I, I was watching Laura Willoughby from Club Soda when she spoke at This Naked Mind. Um, and she, she actually said to write down, when if you get a form, for, for the meal before you go, where it says dietary requirements, put in dietary requirements, alcohol free, I don't drink, you know, as a dietary requirement. I don't know if anyone's ever actually got anywhere with that, but I quite like it in terms of telling people that we're sober and we're proud. Um, yeah. The other thing that I found worked, and this might work for people in your group as well, is on the day of the party, encourage people to post that their party is later that day and kind of become accountable and, so, and commit to sharing a photo of themselves later in the day from the party enjoying themselves alcohol free and then they know that the whole you know they've made a promise to the group and they're kind That's of accountable <laughs> and doing it on the day works I've, I've had quite a few people doing that in my group and actually saying right i'm here you know here's my alcohol free drink i'm having a great time but the the drunk people are getting annoying, so I'm going soon. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know why you're on that as well? Just two other things. I think one is go and enjoy yourself and dance and yeah. don't don't be self conscious because I know when I first danced sober, I was really bothered about what everybody thought about me. And I actually phoned Lisa from the wedding that I went to and said, Oh, you know, I'm bothered. She said, Listen, they're not even gonna remember that you were there in exactly. the morning. Get on that dance floor. <laughs> I was like, yeah, good point. <laughs> That's so and, true. If you need a drink to have a good time at the party, the party's rubbish. Leave. It, it, <laughs> Just go home. It's funny you say that because I was writing something the other day about exactly this and, tr and trying to get that point across that actually – it's the event that's either good or bad, not the booze that makes it good or bad. Yeah. And it was interesting because last year I went to two weddings. One was a really, really good friend and I knew loads of people there and I wasn't obviously not drinking, had a great time talking to people, laughing all day. And then I got invited as a kind of standing 
guest to another wedding and I only knew the bride and one or two other people. And it was boring. I felt like I was just forever telling people my life story and introducing myself and trying to make conversation. I ended up leaving about half past nine and I just didn't have a great time. And then I thought, so if I'd been drinking, I would have still had a good time at wedding number one and I'd have still had a boring time at wedding number two. It wasn't the booze, it was the event and the people. And I kind of proved it to myself and it's a fact. Yeah, we've all, yeah. we've all had crap nights out when we've been drinking and we've had great nights out when we've been drinking. They would have been great or crap regardless of the booze. And I think yeah. the crap one is you probably found that you drank more and more and more to try and make up for the fact that it was crap. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. It'll get it'll become fun in a minute. I know it will. I'll just keep putting these pi- <laughs> I'll put these keep putting these pints away. And then next thing you know, you know, regrettable behaviour, being sick, falling over, whatever, you know. Are you was you there? <laughs> <laughs> I've been there many times. <laughs> but I never have to do it again, thank goodness. No, I know, and that's that for me, that is the I know we talked about benefits, but my biggest and favourite benefit is no hangovers. Yeah. Oh, it's my favourite. So yeah, that's another thing about Christmas parties. Remember, mm-hmm. when you're watching everybody, you're gonna wake up fresh, they're not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, I don't know about you, but I actually for quite a long period I, I feel like I was in a permanent state of hangover I had fuzzy heads a lot oh, headaches yeah. and the funniest thing was around six or eight months after I quit drinking I had this banging headache and I thought god I haven't had a headache for months and months and months yeah. what's this yet yeah, I used to have them all the time and it was just constant hangovers fuzzy heads and just feeling generally you know off color And would you tell everybody you were just tired? (laughs) Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was a very secretive drinker. So I I, I didn't go to the pub much. I'd sit home with a couple of bottles of wine and then in the red wine as well. So in the morning, I'd be scrubbing my tongue, scrubbing my teeth, trying to hide it all. And I was still in in the office at half past seven, eight o'clock in the morning, ready to work. But I was never functioning. I was functioning, but I wasn't being doing my best or the best version that I could have been. So it's yeah, it's been an amazing journey, and I, so many people were scared about it at the start, and I, I was scared. You know, the thought of not drinking feel put a knot in my stomach. It filled me with dread, like it probably did with you guys. But yeah. once you get past those first couple of weeks, and it, you know, it genuinely is the gift that just keeps on giving. It's yeah. amazing. It is. It is the single best decision I ever made. Yeah. We ever made. I think it yeah. is, and like you said, Simon, you can. Uh, the point of when you are drinking, drinking, you cannot imagine a life without alcohol in it. You can't imagine all these events. And I just think it's so good to let people know that you can do all these things and, and just more. so much more, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And the, t- the great thing is the tide is turning. You know, one in three young people are choosing to either drink moderately or they're not drinking at all. It's amazing. And... You know, and also I talk to people about their relationships with their kids. My son's 15 and, you know, he saw me drinking every single day of his life up until I quit. But he's, I have people say to me, oh, it's too late. The damage is done. But he's seen me change and he's learned and he's he's not interested in alcohol now. He knows the facts. He understands it. And he's made, made a decision. I'm sure he'll explore it. But I feel like he's set for success one way or another. And I think when you've done it so positively, it can't help but see how amazing and what a difference it has made to you. I think that with our yeah. kids, really. Not yeah. like ours, but... Yeah, yeah, oh, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> between us, well, they're not shared. <laughs> but it's right, you know, and I suppose, yeah, had it been a a torturous and painful experience where he'd seen me going through it, he would have thought, whoa, yeah, you know, clearly you do need alcohol, whereas... Yeah, I I reframed everything. I just wanted a positive mindset. You know, I wanted to be in this club. I wanted to be part of the sober gang. And yeah, uh, it's a good gang to be in. It is a good gang. And I, I remember my son, who's fourteen, saying to me quite a while ago uh, when I was still drinking, "Oh well, it looks like you have a better time when you're drinking." And that was one of the things that fed and thought, "Oh, you know, what sort of a lesson am I teaching these kids?" Yeah, exactly. And that, that's the. The thing, isn't it? We condition them, and we don't even realise that we're doing it. You know, I, I remember when I was when I was younger. Oh, I can't wait till you're eighteen. I'll take you to the pub on your eighteenth yeah. birthday. You know, and that was just the norm. That was what my dad did with me, and it was 
you know, he drank red wine every night. I wanted to be like him. I thought it was sophisticated and grown up. So I, I started doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, and you grew up in a pub, so you, you stood no chance. Yeah. We just didn't realise, I think, we were talking about this as well, that everybody we ever came into contact with was drunk. Yeah. So why, why would we be any different? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But, you know, it's amazing that you, you know, this is why I think it's the ultimate act of rebellion. It's such an amazing and cool thing to do when you think, no, I'm going to be different. I'm going to do something differently, which is why when we get given those you know, labels like alcoholic and in recovery, I just think people who use those terms, they just don't get what sobriety is about. It's a it's a lifestyle choice. It's a journey of self-discovery. It's, and it's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And we feel exactly the same about it, really positive and focused. And, you know, and if somebody wants to say that they're an alcoholic, fine, that's their choice. We're not going to criticise that. Um, but, yeah, it, it's much better, in my opinion, and in yours, to look forward, look at the positives yeah. and show it's a choice, yeah. You're not forced to not drink. If I want to go now and go and get a bottle of wine and sit there and drink it, I will, but no thanks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, hopefully people watching this will realise that it's not just me that it radiates these positive vibes because it's crazy. <laughs> you know, it's good. I, you know, I love it. There's so many people, you know, inspirational people who are making a difference, sharing their stories, and you know, you guys are doing exactly the same thing. And it, it, you know, there's so many other options now. I got, I was on a, um, a radio interview a couple of weeks ago, and the guy said to me, you know, aren't, aren't the options just AA or rehab? And uh, I mean, he, he was leading me into a question to talk about online groups and stuff but obviously they're not and there's so many people who are giving up their time and you know they're, they're not just out to make money or 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 you know rip people off or anything like that they're passionate about what they do and they just want to share their story and give something back and it's just so amazing there's just an incredible mix of people to you know there's someone for everyone i think and a group for everybody yeah i agree it's it's the first time, Simon, I've ever, I'm like, I've turned 40 this year. And in 40 years, it's the first time I've ever felt good about the people I've surrounded myself with. I feel like comfortable and in a happy place with sober people. They're just so kind and caring and sharing and like you said, positive and inspirational. And to just see that on my news feed, because you yeah. know, on Instagram and Facebook, it's like, oh, I found my tribe. Yeah, that's what <laughs> it is, it's a tribe. tribe. <laughs> yeah, and, and the least judgmental people I've ever met oh, as well. Yeah. You know, and but I think, you know, you've got to, I sometimes feel like I say all these things and I try and you know, motivate people and get them excited about what a life of sobriety is like but you have to believe it you've got to try it you know yeah you have yeah, you know, and I would say you need to give it a good do 30 days absolutely but if you can do 90 you're home free you'll yeah. never go back no you won't I totally agree because when obviously we've got dry January coming up and it it always frustrates me a little bit i love that people do it but i feel like you don't you kind of just it's like doing the hard bit of the assault course and then the, there's an actually a really easy part afterwards and all the fun starts and you miss out on it yeah. but uh, yeah i think that's why our 30 day experiment is so important because when people do do dry january they feel a lot of people feel like they're missing out for that whole month and it's like I'm looking oh, forward to the first of feb yeah, yeah it's dull january it's dark it's this and they feel yeah. really tired after christmas so our kind of 30 day experiment turns that all on its head and gets you to really focus on the positives of all that so yeah, yeah. that's awesome like, yeah i hope loads of people join it and i i mean i always I think you know 30 days is a great start point and then as you get towards the end right what are you going to commit to now we're we going to do 60 we're we going to do 90 like you said but you know, it's but you know talking about a lifetime of sobriety for somebody at the start sometimes is can seem really really scary I think yeah, yeah small step but for me it was that's it I'm getting divorced this relationship's become toxic it's over um, yeah but it, it is what fits for different people I think you have to work out what feels right for you some people know after a couple of weeks I'm just never going back to this and for yeah. others they might need 30 days 60 days 90 days and often we find ourselves back at the start and have to learn from those slip-ups and go again you know it's very rare that you 
I don't know many people who didn't try a few times without having a few slip ups, um, and yeah. that's all part of the process. But once you once you get through that part, it's just amazing. It's you know the grass is definitely greener on the other side. Definitely is. It is definitely. Oh, that's awesome. Well, look, thanks for giving up your time to talk to me, and I, I love what you're doing with the sober experiment. And uh, you know, keep keep me updated with how it's going. And yeah, you know, I love hearing all about it and knowing how it's getting on but thanks for your time today both of you oh thank you for having us yeah really appreciate your time and we will see you soon as well because we're coming to see you at the mindful drinking festival in january so oh awesome yeah i'm talking at that on the on the saturday so that'll be great we're gonna come and say hello (laughs) oh brilliant i'm on about five o'clock so i look forward to that we'll come and find you (laughs) oh awesome thanks again for for coming on to the video thank you thank you simon see you later bye